Yeah, I want to introduce the Naval Academy and what we have to offer to uh, the students, uh, academically and then uh, service-wise, because there's a five-year commitment for a minimum of five-year commitment to all of the graduates. Okay. Well, first off, it's located in Annapolis, Maryland. And it's, uh, it's, it's on the waterfront on the Severn River, which flows into the Chesapeake Bay. So it's the Chesapeake Bay community. And uh, fortunately, we've got Washington, D.C., 25 miles that way, Baltimore, 25 miles that way. And when the midshipmen walk out the visitor's gate at gate one, they're downtown Annapolis in the harbor. I mean, that's, that's neat. The other academies can't say anything like that. Okay. First off, we're ranked number one public school in the country. Which is, which is pretty good. Um, we have very uh, uh, high rankings on all of our engineering courses. We're, we're a STEM school. 80% um, of the midshipmen will take STEM-related majors, only 20% non-STEM. Train midshipmen morally, mentally, physically. That's a profound statement, morally, mentally, physically. Not just the education, but everything else that comes with it. The leadership part is a we're a leadership laboratory, too. So. Well, I can tell you the Naval Academy Brotherhood is very, very strong. Um, I graduated in 1961, <laughs> a couple of years ago. And every Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock, I have a Zoom happy hour meeting with my classmates from all around the country. Every month, there's a group of my classmates that meet up in Brandon for lunch. And the, my, uh, the uh, kids of my classmates refer to me as uncle. I mean, that's how strong the Brotherhood is at the Naval Academy. I mean, once, once you get put this on, it's forever. Uh, on average, uh, the midshipmen have 18 hour credit hours per semester. Uh, they can go as high as 22 or 23. Uh, average civilian college maybe is, is down like 12 or 14. So uh, it's, it's intense. And all the midshipmen have to play a sport every sports season in addition to that. There, there's no goofing off. There's no free time. And uh, along with that, we have all, all of our professional training that goes along with all of that as well. And, uh, and then if, if you're a plebe, you're getting beat up by the upperclassmen at the same time. So it's intense, yes. The big ones are surface warfare officer, drive ships, submarines, aviation, and uh, we also graduate midshipmen into the Marine Corps. So they have all of the Marine Corps options as well on top of all of that. So, yeah. And then if you don't qualify to do one of those uh, warfighting specialties, we have a whole series of, of non-warfare specialties, oceanography, intelligence, et cetera. And, oh, wait, I forgot the SEALs. Can't forget the SEALs. Yeah. SEALs and explosive ordnance disposal as well. And what we do during the uh, four years, all the midshipmen get introduced to all of their warfare specialties. So when the time comes, senior year, and they have to make up their mind how they want to get commissioned, what community, they know all about all of them already, and they've made up their mind well before graduation. Uh, I was an inner city kid from Bridgeport, Connecticut, and I got to go to the Naval Academy, and I got to fly airplanes for the Navy. You know, my childhood dream. So I, I'm giving back, and, and I love it. That's my payday when I can present an appointment, which I'm going to do in a few days at Admiral Farragut, when I can present an appointment to the Naval Academy to one of my candidates. It's, that's my payday. Okay, what the Academy has to offer them as a lifetime. It's not graduating and go off on your own. I mean, this is a lifetime thing. Um, the training they get at the academy, like I said, morally, mentally, physically sticks with them for their entire life. So that, that's what I want them to take away is uh, what the academy has to offer them in turn for them serving our country. That's the big thing, service to our country. We are trying to get information out to as many people, students and parents, uh, on not just West Point, but of the five service academies. Uh, as long as I've been doing this, uh, I become uh, still surprised at the number of parents and the number of students who have never heard of West Point. 
and I'm, re I'm rem reminded of what my parents experienced when in sixth grade I came home from attending a private military school and it was the first time I had been home since we uh, I went and I told my parents that I walked in the door I'm going to West Point and my parents said where and they were both born and raised in Rochester New York we, we are considered Ivy League and we're the, we're the fourth ranked engineering school in the nation and we were the first engineering college or university in our nation's history when we were chartered in 1802 Yes, there's approximately 36 undergraduate programs that they can get a bachelor's of science degree in. The interesting thing is we remain true to our engineering heritage in that um, a student can get a degree in English or history, but they're still going to be taking math, three, three course uh, of study in, in, in engineering field of their choice, uh, heavy emphasis on physics, chemistry, and... Uh, so they'll come out and be able to do third order differential equations better than any other English major anywhere. And they'll start that out in their uh, cadet basic training, which is where they'll report to uh, in uh, tail end of June, beginning of July um, of their plebe year. They'll do six weeks to seven weeks of training there. Then they'll go on to academics and their academics will go essentially August to, to May. And then they'll do more military training both voluntary, in other words, they might want to go to airborne school, they might want to go to air assault school, uh, combat diver school, uh, but they'll, they'll still do military training. And each successive summer, their, their placement in a leadership position helps to develop their core leadership values. And uh, to, to when they become first classmen, they, they are cadet officers and uh, they are leading the Corps. And I, and I tell cadets that I talk to, you don't have to worry about going and working at Burger King and McDonald's during the summer because that's when you're going to do your, your military training. And I also tell them that could they go home for three, four, five weeks of vacation each summer? Absolutely, but that's not why you're going to West Point. I encourage them to take advantage of uh, all the educational, op military education opportunities that take place during the, the summers. Uh, to better prepare themselves and to also give them a better taste and flavor for what's available in the in the army when they get there. It's, it's a total of eight years, five years active and three years in individual ready reserve unless they uh, elect to uh, extend it to eight years uh, in order to get either the branch they want, the post they want, or if you're going to go to flight school you're going to have an eight-year commitment. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we'll have, on average, between 13 and 15,000 individuals uh, apply each and every year. And out of that, we'll, we'll accept about 1,200 plus minus uh, into each new graduating class. And they will be joined by 14 to 16 individuals from foreign nations whose nations actually pay West Point to train their future leaders. The, the purpose is twofold, to continue to build the relationship with those allies uh, through access to programs like, the, like West Point. Um, and it's also beneficial to the cadets because they begin to learn to get along with and make friends with uh, individuals from foreign countries. You're not going to learn everything about a country in a classroom. You learn it by getting out and meeting, meeting and socializing with the people from that country. And uh, so in each class, like I said, there's 14 to 16 uh, individuals from foreign countries. Uh, I tell the candidates that uh, I work with that you will meet individuals when you get to West Point who will end up being your friends for life. And that's a rare, that doesn't happen at Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. You might have four or five, but I'm talking four or five hundred well, if you want to be a leader, you've already demonstrated through your high school years your dedication to service and service to others, service to school. But if you want to learn how to become a leader, why not become a leader at the premier leadership training institution in the world? Uh, the most important message for the parents that say is everything is free because it's total, it's total scholarship. And the value of that is $233,000 for the four years. And because the, we, we eat feed them, we clothe them, we educate them, we train them, and uh, the good point is the parents don't have to pay for college, the bad point is they lose the tax deduction. So, um, but no, I, I tell mothers especially, remember what your son or daughter was like when they were through high school. 
when they come home for Christmas for the first time, let me know the change you see in them. Because I've, and I've had parents, mothers, especially call me up and tell you, hey, you were, you were right. She doesn't leave piles and trail of clothes through, throughout the house. The bathroom is always clean. She says, it's just, it, it's an amazing turnaround. Yeah. Well, they learn personal responsibility too. You know, mom and dad aren't there to, to take care of you all, all the time. You need to start taking care of yourself. The, the goal of our academy uh, is primarily to attract young people who are interested in having uh, a career in the Merchant Marine. Uh, besides that, we're also an alternate method to get into any of the services at graduation. What's different about Kings Point than the other schools is you don't have to make a decision about how you're going to repay the government until just before graduation from Kings Point, and then you can apply to any of the services, including NOAA, the hurricane people, or you can actually not serve on active duty, you will have to be a reserve officer for eight years. So it's a very, it's a very different uh, uh, obligation format than the other schools. It's just as hard to get into. Uh, we offer very few degrees. They're all very technical. We're a very technical school. And we're looking for people who, uh, th we're looking for the brightest and the best with leadership and good qualities. And, and it's a huge uh, differentiator in, in your life if you get into the school. Uh, the hardest part, uh, we have a, uh, the center on our football team can do calculus or he goes home. There are no, we have no fluff degrees. We have three engineering degrees and two degrees in logistics. Uh, all of them are compressed into a three-year period because you spend one full year of your academy time out at sea on an internship traveling all over the world. Uh, uh, the easiest way to describe the Merchant Marine is if you go out to the interstate, you'll see all these trucks going by with different people's names on them from different companies. Sometimes they're even owned by the Army. When you go out in the middle of the ocean, it's the same thing. All these ships go by. They're owned by different people. They have different names on them. That's the Merchant Marine. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason that the federal government has a Merchant Marine Academy is if the government decides to send all these other people across the world to fight a war, they need supplies. And uh, like during World War II, they estimated they needed 3,000 ships and a million men to man them. We're the insurance policy for that. This is just a great opportunity for a few young people in Manatee County. You need to be interested, you need to be motivated, you need to be in the very top of your class. But particularly in the case of Kings Point, a lot of people don't even know that we exist. If they don't know that we exist, they can't apply, and then one seat gets wasted every year. This is a $300,000 scholarship. So I actually graduated last year in 2023 from the Air Force Academy, and I've just been doing this admissions job, uh, kind of helping students uh, get to where they want to be. Um, so we actually graduated at the same time. So we both graduated last summer, and we're doing this job for about a year. I'm headed to pilot training in a couple months, and Lieutenant Singh is headed to cyber training for the Space Force. Uh, it's a great school because there's just so many opportunities that you have available to you that's not available to other colleges. You get to jump out of a plane, you get to fly gliders, you get to you know, build satellites and send them up to space. The Air Force Academy has nine satellites, which is more than 160 other countries in the, in the world. And uh, yeah, just, just a bunch of really cool opportunities that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Every, uh, every student will actually graduate with a Bachelor's of Science. So there's a lot of core class. You have to take like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, you know, a bunch of different type of engineering classes, chemistry, physics. And all of that will uh, earn you a Bachelor's of Science when you graduate, no matter what major you do. So, while we are a STEM school, we can also major in non-STEM um, courses in your education. So I was actually a legal studies major, which has nothing to do with flying planes, but that's one of the awesome things that the Air Force Academy has to offer. Um, I got to study something that I loved and then knew that I was going to be a pilot anyways. So that was kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, so I think a lot of like the mental block for a lot of parents is going to be like, oh, you have to join the military afterwards. But I see that as like such a great opportunity. Like she's got her dream job. I've got a job where I'm like super excited to work with like all these big companies in the cyber field. And like after five years of military service, we're going to have an incredible resume, which is something I'm really excited for. And uh, like it's just such a unique experience in general that not a lot of people get to be a part of. And you learn a lot of unique skills and get a lot of discipline that I feel like you otherwise at a normal college wouldn't get. Uh, so yeah, you actually 
to have obligations in the summer, but a lot of cadets say that the summer is the best time at the academy. You get to go on a lot of cool trips. Like I, went, I got to go to Wisconsin for a research project. She got to go to the Pentagon. Uh, you know, cadets get to go to Morocco to study Arabic. They get to go all over. You get to go to different Air Force bases, get to fly in the back of a jet. So, so many cool opportunities in the summer. Um, in addition to those like educational opportunities, we also have um, a lot of airmanship programs at the Air Force Academy that you do in the summer. So those include like jumping out of aircraft. Um, the Air Force Academy is the only place in the world where after 72 hours of ground training, you jump out of an airplane completely solo by yourself. Um, yes, sir, I did do that my freshman year and it was pretty nerve wracking, but <laughs> I don't think I'll ever do it again, but it was, it was a good time. Um, and then we have programs for learning how to fly planes and becoming instructor pilots in planes for the rest of your cadet career. Um, so we have a lot of good aviation-based programs in the summer as well. So within like every single community, like whether it be like North Texas, you know, Gulf Coast, Florida, there's a lot of parents clubs and uh, all the families will come together. They'll watch football games. They'll host cadets for activities once they uh, get home for breaks. So there's a lot of opportunity to connect with people in your area, like with other parents in your area. And there's just a big community supporting the uh, cadets at USAFA. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to, you know, become an officer in the United States military. Uh, I think at the end of the day, like my biggest piece of advice would be don't say no to any opportunities that, you know, may come your way because it's easy to do the comfortable thing. But, uh, you know, if you go out of your way to stick your neck out and do something that, you know, is a little bit difficult, there's a lot of reward in that. I think not only is the Air Force Academy an opportunity for a world-class education, debt free. Um, it's also going to develop you as a person so you'll be completely well-rounded and have so much character and leadership development when you graduate that's going to help you in any capacity of your life, not only in your career in the Air Force or Space Force. Um, so considering the Air Force Academy is, it's never going to be a bad idea, I suppose. I think the most important thing to me is having the capacity to lead people well um, and make an impact on their lives. I think the Air Force Academy really primes cadets to have good leadership skills and allows them to interact with underclassmen um, and then their leaders above them in terms of permanent parties. So you have a lot of like back and forth leadership, um, which is a great leadership laboratory. And then you can apply those skills to the operational Air Force when you graduate. So I would say my favorite aspect of the military so far has been the community. Like you can go to any base and you'll see friendly faces and that starts at USAPA. Like you meet so many people throughout your time there and then once you graduate, any base you go to, you'll, you'll come across friendly faces and it just makes it that much easier to, you know, build a good community and, uh, you know, use that to lead the airmen that uh, you're in charge of. Thank you for coming to Goodwill, Minnesota today. I would like to introduce Don Givens and uh, thank him and, and his staff and Pavitra for having us today and, and allowing us to use this space. It's a wonderful um, organization in the community. Uh, Don Givens is the president and CEO of Goodwill Industries, Minnesota, a nonprofit dedicated to closing the skills gap and addressing inequities. With 18 years experience in the Goodwill network, he led GIMI's DGR operations and oversaw marketing, real estate, and more before his current role. He also held key roles at Goodwill of North Georgia and Goodwill Industries of the Southern Rivers. Givens holds an MBA from Ashford University, a Bachelor of Sci Science from Florida State University, and has completed leadership programs with Goodwill Industries International and the University of Georgia Fanning Institute. Givens currently serves as president of the Florida Goodwill uh, association, excuse me, <laughs> chair-elect of the Florida Recycling Partnership Foundation and is board member of the Manatee Chamber of Commerce. Goodwill Minnesota has been supportive of veterans. Um, I've attended several veterans task force meetings here, um, so we're really grateful for them in the community. Thank you for allowing us to come here and host this great event and supporting uh, these students and families. Uh, Don? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
I have the pleasure of introducing Congressman Buchanan, and uh, but before we do that, if we could all just stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It's great to have everyone here. I apologize. Uh, last year we had 30, and this year we have more than that. Uh, so um, we're just so pleased to help support this initiative by Congressman Buchanan and his team for the nominations process. Uh, Ryan, who I don't believe in his room, is in the room right now with our Veterans Task Force team. Um, he's actually a West Point grad. Um, so he's another resource for all of you students looking for information about what it's really like. Uh, as part of the uh, academy life. Uh, I'm sure he could be a great resource for you to tap into. And he's at University in Lockwood Ridge most days. So without further ado, Congressman Buchanan is co-chair of the bipartisan 30-member Florida congressional delegation and vice chair of the powerful House Ways and Means Committee, which has jur jurisdiction over tax policy, international trade, health care, welfare, Social Security, and Medicare. Buchanan is the most senior Republican of the committee and currently serves as chairman of the health subcommittee. Buchanan grew up with five siblings in a blue collar household in a small town near Detroit, Michigan. He served six years in the Air National Guard and worked his way through college. The self-made businessman is a respected leader in the Florida business community. A husband and a father, Congressman Buchanan lives in Longbow Key, Florida with Sandy, his wife of more than 40 years. Vern and Sandy have two grown sons, James and Matt, and nine grandchildren. And I heard two new Labradoodle Golden Retriever puppies, right? Uh, Congressman Buchanan, it's all yours, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, well, I actually have number 10 grandchild. We had two sons, and the youngest one uh, is having the se seventh one uh, this June, nine and under. And then we have my oldest son serves in the state legislature. Our youngest son runs our, some of our businesses. But he's basically got three. So that's going to put us at 10. So 10, 9, and under. And then my wife, she asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And I said two golden doodles. And she got me two golden doodles. So it's, it's pretty crazy that way. Uh, let me just thank, uh, thank Don, CEO. Uh, he's done an unbelievable job. Don, what you've done here is just incredible. Your vision, hard work, and and uh, made a big difference, but we need a little bigger room uh, next time. Give everybody, everybody a seat, so thank you very much. Also, I just want to thank all the academies that are here represented and the people that are hosting those uh, for them. And then I want to thank the student and the parents. I would just tell you that, you know, as a blue-collar kid, one of six kids, uh, you know, I didn't even, never heard about the service academies, but what it does for kids is unbelievable. I, you know, as a business guy, I started in business, got an undergrad degree, but I just know because I've been around a lot of companies, bigger companies, and a lot of our Fortune 500 companies, and including Congress today, what's happened, a lot of the kids uh, that have served in the military are now coming into Congress, which we didn't have that for a while, and they get such a premium, frankly, because of you know, their credibility, they're, you know, uh, really key to a lot of the communities they're in, so they make a big difference that way. So. But I want to thank the kids for their hard work, and uh, I'm a believer. You get out of life what you expect. So if you don't think you're going to get it, then you won't. And if you think you're going to get it, work hard. And uh, if any of you haven't been to some of the academies you're interested in, you need to talk to your parents and uh, taking them there. Because uh, if they get, if you get the nomination, it'll save their, your parents about. Well, this cost the taxpayers about six hundred thousand dollars. So it's a big investment we make. I take it very serious. We put 170 kids. We've nominated 170 kids over the years. Of course, I've been here for a while now, but uh, it's it's a big deal. Also, someone asked me, "What do you? Well, how do I work this? What what's the process?" Suzanne, she's the boss. So I would just tell you that. Uh, get with her, make sure she walks through the process, and uh, we try to put as many kids as we can. And I said 170. I mean, one year we put in two young ladies from Palmetto High School. I was so excited, you know, being a blue collar kid myself. I always kind of, every, every kid's important, but I know that sometimes they got to work a little bit harder. And we put two girls in there in the Naval Academy, and they're graduated. And so it's, it's very, very exciting to me. Um, 
you know, every congressional district has so many nominations. I'm pretty fortunate because I've been here long enough. I work with the senators and with sometimes you say, oh, we got a big crowd here today. Well, we might be able to get normally five or six, but we might be able to pick up another three or four uh, working with the senators uh, to fill a slot, especially in our in our region. Um, the, uh, the applicants have to meet strict qualifications to be interviewed by a nonpartisan service board academy. So regardless of your politics, this isn't about politics. This is about getting the best people. And I will say that, uh, as many of you know, 80% are young men and, and then 20% are young women. So I think it's pretty exciting. But it, it's got to be something you want to do because it won't be easy. I went in the service at 18, but nothing like what you're going to be put up against. So it's got to be something you're completely and totally committed to because it's a four-year commitment. Then after that, it's another five years. And I tell people, if you're thinking about when you get in, you're thinking about doing something else, you need to call me because you've taken a slot from somebody else. So you got to be tough and you got to be mentally tough and emotionally tough to get through the process. Uh, I don't know if I could have back then, but it's a pretty tough process. Um, let me just say the other thing is, is that, you know, like I had two sons, one played football for Bobby Bowden, Florida State, and the other one went to Stanford. You know, they got good education, especially Stanford, good education, but this is different. You're going to get that kind of an education, Stanford, Ivy League, my, it's just my opinion. But on top of that, you're going to come out with leadership skills, be a second lieutenant, and have a five-year commitment. Well, that's going to set you up for not just being you know, smart and capable and academically, but it's going to, you're going to have to manage people. You're going to have to lead people. And that's going to set you up for a whole other opportunity, which I think is the ideal situation for someone that wants to do that. Um, I always mentioned that, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, and I, I just, I'm not telling you this to braggadocious or anything, but as a blue collar kid, first in my family to go to college, I went to, in the service at 18, got out, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, eight people in our house, the house was like, you know, 800 square feet, so that's the house I grew up in. But I went, my roommate in college, I mean, in, in the service said if he had, a, he had a, got a PhD in, uh, laser physics or something. But he said, Vern, if I had to do it all over again, I said, what'd you do? He said, I'd go get a four-year business degree. Well, that led to getting me a degree, getting in a big company. I realized they didn't like big companies, so my wife and I had been married 45 years. We decided to start a little company called Speedy Printing with a couple of stores. Maybe some of you heard it. And that went from two stores to 800 with little or no money. We started with just sweat equity, you know, that period of time. Sold that out of Michigan, came to Florida, got in the car business and built a billion dollar business there and from scratch. So both, both of them were 15 years. Then I got crazy and ran for Congress and won by 369 votes. But I tell you that story because anything's possible. I believe in America, we have, we, got, we have challenges, we got challenges, but we're still the best place on the planet. No question about it. And that's why I get so excited about one of the most important things I look at for me is helping our place the best kids we can uh, in, the, in these opportunities. So we're open-minded to everybody and uh, we wanna do everything we can. We're here to help you and help your parents get through the process. So again, uh, let's, Roll up, Suzanne, I'm going to kick it back to you. But uh, like I said, she's great. And not, the only thing I'll say, some people, we do have office in Lakewood Ranch, three offices, but we do look for kids, the intern, uh, and, you know, can't give any guarantees to anybody, but to intern, get involved, uh, that can make a big difference, too, just in terms of better understanding, you know, what we do and how we do it. And it's one thing to read a book. I remember I had the government class. I'm not sure I remember anything out of that going in high school. But if you're in the, in the, um, in the process, it's a big difference. And then you got the process on top of it. you got the governance end of it, and then we're going into the process where it's going to be much more political. So you get to see both sides of it. And I tell you that partly for the other reason, because a lot of kids that are, you know, uh, in Congress today or senators or governors, you know, the governor of our state, same thing. You know, they basically were, you know, kids that started out in the same situation where they've had that those opportunities. So anything I can do personally to help you, we're glad. That's why we're here. And uh, I tell people, someone said to me one time, I had like 400 people in a room and they were saying, you work for me. Someone yelled out in the back of the room. And I said, you're right. I'm a representative. That's how I view this job. It's not like I need the job, but I want to make a difference for the country. The country has been special to me. So thank you and God bless.
Thank you, Congressman. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the nominations process with our office and, and what that looks like and how you can make sure you've got it on time and, and what things are required from our office to get a nomination. First and foremost, it's crucial to prepare. Uh, you don't want to apply the week before because it requires several different steps that will require time, like a letter of recommendation. And you'll need to get those from different members in your community that are not your family. Um, so your mom can't write the letter for you. It has to be a teacher, um, another community leader, cl a club leader that you're a part of, anything like that. Um, and, and this is all on our website, buchanan.house.gov. Um, the application is actually on the website. It's all digital, and it will have a space for you to add the extra documents that are required for the application. My email is also on the nominations form, the checklist. So if you have any extra do documents that did not fit on the online application, you can email them directly to me. Um, make sure with your cover letter and headshot, uh, we want to know why do you want to go to an academy, why you feel like you're qualified, a headshot of you. And also, um, we want a resume of your job, any job experience or volunteer experience or any of the clubs you've been in. Um, the judges for the congressman really want to see leadership experiences, uh, that you're active in the community and things like that, beyond just good grades. Good grades are great, but also it, it's a little more than just getting good grades, right? Like I said, the two personal recommendation letters, uh, a copy of your SAT and or your ACT scores, start taking these tests early. You know, we want to see the scores when, when you come in for an interview. So if you haven't signed up to take a test yet, go ahead and do that. You can start early because you, you don't know what score you're going to get. You might want to take it multiple times. Um, and then lastly, we want a copy of your government issued ID just so we can verify that you're in the district and things like that. Um, make sure when you're applying for a nomination that you apply to all available sources that you can. You can apply to your congressman. Um, you can apply to your U.S. senators. The, there's a vice presidential. There's a presidential nomination. I believe that's for career um, sons and daughters of career veterans. Um, but that, so that's not available to everyone. But there's definitely more than one nomination spot. So you can't count on getting a nomination because, as the congressman mentioned, we have a limited number of nominations we can get. Of course, we want to nominate as many people as possible, um, but we are limited to, at that extent. And, and lastly, um, we can give you a nomination, but remember that it is also up to the academy to offer you the appointment. So a nomination is not a guarantee that you will get into the academy, but it is definitely a crucial and important step of that process. And if you have any questions, feel free to call the office. Uh, ask for myself, Susanna Morrison, and on our website, we also have more information on the application, like I mentioned. Um, yeah, seize this opportunity today. Speak to the different representatives from the academies. Um, the path, you know, to the academies, it, it may be a little long, and there's a lot of information, and some of it may be repetitive, but staying, staying with it, you know, that's, that's the key, is being determined. Um, judges like to see leadership, sports, clubs, volunteering, like I was mentioning. Um, check in with, with our office and myself on the status of your nomination file. Don't assume that we have everything, um, if you, especially if you send anything by mail. Even in the application portal online, sometimes there's tech issues, things like that. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm so glad to see everyone. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Charles Cook from West Point. And he's going to speak briefly about the West Point initiatives. What I'd like to be able to do is just share with you a little bit of information, but about five minutes. Charles and I, we've been working together now for a number of years, supporting candidates as they navigate through the application process to earn a nomination and hopefully an appointment to West Point. He lives down here in Braden area. I live up in the Brandon Valrico area. Our third colleague, Dan O'Dell, he lives even further north up in Wesley Chapel. But we work together, so please feel free to go and take uh, one of our cards, take advantage of the materials that we have for you here, so then you, you know basically how to start. What I'd like to be able to do is just show, there we go, West Point degree. I've been able to go up to West Point three times in the last couple of years. We've got a new superintendent who used to be 
the Commandant of Cadets. He's responsible for the military education development of all of the cadets at West Point. General, now he's a Lieutenant General Three Star Stephen Gilland. He served 12 years with the Ranger Regiment as well as Special Operations Forces. And when I was up there last time, after a march back at the luncheon, he asked us if we could help spread the word that when you graduate from West Point, you earn a degree in leadership and character development. Now you're gonna find that all the academies are gonna provide you with a great education. We're focused on developing leaders of character that are gonna lead our men and women into armed conflict. I'll touch briefly on the national rankings. You know, it's always a rivalry with Army, Air Force, Army, Navy, all the others. And then we're gonna talk about the legacy of leadership who's gone to West Point before. We've got a command video. You're gonna hear General Gillen's voice on there as well as a couple others. And then I'm gonna to touch on the physical demands. Being a soldier is physically demanding. Yes, there are desk jobs in the Army. However, we train all of our cadets to be able to handle the physical rigors of leading soldiers in combat. And so you're gonna see a slide on this towards the end. Okay. So just a couple things here. Uh, Row Scholars and Marshall Scholars were number one there. This just gives you a, a brief look. You know, we're competitive there with the Navy and Air Force as well. So you're going to a really great, high caliber educational institution. This is our legacy. Uh, happened to meet Nadia West a few years ago up in D.C. Turns out that her brother is my classmate. She's an Army aviator. Her husband is also an Army aviator. So we got to tell stories about what it's like during your training to go ahead and feed the Rangers. Uh, when I went to Ranger school, uh, we have air mobile operations, and the ru rules were don't feed the Rangers. But invariably, they'd look around the bird, and if there wasn't a Ranger instructor on board, out would come these Big Macs, candies, and all the stuff, and all the trash would be going out, out the window. It was really cool to be able to talk uh, to her and her husband. These are some of the other members uh, of our long gray line, is what we call it. No, we don't have Top Gun. We don't have Tom Cruise. This is who we have. Okay, so this is a slide I wanted to share with you. Monthly, West Point Admissions has field force training webinars. This is one from February. This slide is from our Department of Physical Education. And what we want to do here is to highlight some of the physical rigors of West Point. Not only making it through West Point, but then serving as an officer in the Army. So you see here different pictures that show how potentially grueling it can be. There in the middle, under set the standard, it's a woman carrying a, a artillery shell. So what we need to do is make sure that you as leaders, when you graduate from West Point, you can do what you tell your soldiers to do or ask your soldiers to do. You lead by example. We've got combatives. You know, boxing is required sport up at West Point. You're for women too. You learn how to take a hit and hit back. Uh, various obstacles that we've got here, being able to carry somebody you know, off the battlefield. So it's, it's physically demanding. Now Charles Cook, was activated for 27 months on active duty when he was an Army Reservist, went up to West Point to revamp the admissions process. We require videos. Right now, we still require the push-up videos as well as the pull-up videos or the flex arm hang videos. Reason why was people were showing up and when they tested, they said, oh yeah, I can do eight pull-ups. And when they get there, check in, first day when you go to Beast Barracks, you go through the CFA candidate fitness assessment, and they can only do maybe one or two. So that's one of two problems. One, that's either an integrity issue, you said you could do something you didn't, or you cheated, somebody kind of hit bobs instead of push-ups for you, or it was a discipline issue. You didn't maintain the physical standards needed to be able to enter West Point. So we still require those videos. If you happen to go to Navy, SLE, Summer Leaders Experience, keep in mind, you're competing against those that are going in the Navy, not Army. I had a young man from one of my other uh, districts who said, hey, I passed the CFA at Navy. I said, well, where are your videos? 
He didn't submit his video. So we closed his file. He didn't complete his file in, by January 31st of his senior year. So make sure you stay up on top of the requirements. Charles and I and Dan are here to help you. Okay, so we'll be available for any questions. It's great to see folks that I've already met. If I haven't met you before, please take the time to introduce me, take one of my cards, email me back saying, hey, I met you at Congressman Buchanan's Service Academy Day. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and continue working with you. Okay. So again, I know, Savannah, we've got a lot of other people come on up here and speak, so yeah. thank you for your time. And ALO, Admissions Liaison Officers, I have uh, most of the schools in Manatee and Sarasota counties. Each one of these academies is unique. There are both, both, they are all leadership schools. They teach you, it's an unbelievable curricula. And I've been doing this, this is the end of my 23rd year of doing this and I've worked with I think it's 452 kids and let me tell you what I've seen and what I'm going to spend my few minutes on is getting in the places I mean they're really cool if you can get in and what I have seen over the years um, the Air Force Academy when you start to fill out all the forms and by the way in ALO uh, we have a blue and green back there. Or, what are you? Gold. Gold. Yeah. Green is what I get when I get on a Navy boat. That's what it is. But anyway, they're probably the best assets that you guys and girls have that's in this room. Now, one of my sore points is in the nomination procedure, there are a variety of ways and places to get nominations. It's completely separate than appointments. In order to get an appointment, you have to have a nomination. Congressman Buchanan, the U.S. Senators, the Vice President, they can have five kids at each of the academies at any one time. There are other avenues of getting nominations like through the JROTC, among others, um, these are all limited. So what I'm really saying is apply to all the academies, particularly, the, I mean, it'd be nice if you was interested in all of them, but don't just apply to one. Use every nomination source that you have and fill out the bloody papers. Year, not too many years ago, up for maybe five, six years ago, I typically have 30-some kids that I work with as a mentor every year. So let's pick 30. That's a nice number. For years and years and years, if I had 30 kids, I would have 15, I mean, uh, 21 of those, 70% fill out all of our 15 forms. I, there was myself, another Air Force ALO, and well, two, there was three of us all together. And I, I have 34 and another guy has uh, 44 and the other one had, we wound up with a few over a hundred candidates to get an appointment, 16% returned them. 16% used to be 70. You can't get in the academies without doing the paperwork. Now, the other side of this is in, in 2024, there's more or less uh, 3,400,000 high school seniors going to graduate. We're really in the top I'm going to be generous and say in the top 10%. So out of 3.4 million, there's 340,000 in the top 10%. I don't know the real number, and I'm going to make a guess based. The Air Force Academy tries to get 1,200 kids. 
So let's just say that when you take all the service academies, we get 5,000 kids. I don't know, but that's a nice number. So we're taking 5,000 out of 300,000. So you have to do the paperwork. The SATs, we all score on super scores, meaning if you know what you, you can take them multiple times and we pick the, we don't combine the ACT and the SATs. So super scoring, you can take, say, the SAT and they'll pick the highest uh, results. So if you go up in one and down in the other one, they'll take the new high one and the old the older score. And I don't care what anybody tells you, I don't care what you read, but if you want to go to the Air Force Academy, you have to have 1,300 or more, period. So if you don't have 1,300, take it again. Now, I, all I do is numbers. And three times, I've, between the first time and second time, I've seen 100 points difference. I have seen probably 25 or 30 points difference in the third time, and then it kind of flattens out. Same thing with the ACTs. You can read whatever you want, but if you don't get 30s, you're not competitive. Use, and I know I've said this, but use the resources that you have. I communicate with the kids three times. If, if, if the academy contacts me and say, you've been assigned Susie Smith to be your mentor, I send her an email. And if I don't get a response, I send her another one. And if I don't get another response, I send her a third one. And that's it. I don't take her name out of the list, but I'm going to work with kids who want to work. So the moral of the story is, well, there's this poem, really lovely poem, and, the la and I don't remember it all, but the name of it is Endurance, which kind of fits this thing. You're only, the only person responsible for you filling out the paperwork is you. I mean, mothers are better than dads, and I ask my son, uh, but ultimately, you have to do the paperwork. So I'm sure the West Point has already spoken and the other guys are going to talk. But whichever school you go to, apply to a couple, get all the nominations you can, and do the paperwork. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Singh, and uh, this is Lieutenant Schaefer. She's going to be a pilot trainee, and then I'm going to Space Force School coming up pretty soon. Uh, we're both 2023 grads. Uh, and I have uh, two main talking points here. One is going to be for the students. It's going to be about like the day-to-day -day rigors of the academy because that's something I get a lot of, or asked a lot as a recent grad. So uh, the first challenge you're going to experience is basic training, which is I, I'm sure a lot of that is like looming over the heads of y'all. But uh, I often describe it as the most fun you'll never want to have again. You'll get close to uh, a lot of people. Uh, you'll make like friendships that'll last like your entire four years. And then once you enter the actual Air Force, you'll see them come up at you know every base you go to. Uh, Lieutenant Schaefer and I, we, uh, we actually met each other when we were working basic for the freshman, uh, our junior year. So we ended up at the same base together. And uh, yeah, you'll just see people everywhere. So that six weeks, is, uh, it's pretty tough, but it's definitely a rewarding experience. You'll learn everything you need to know to prepare you for the academic year. But uh, I would say the real rigor starts during the academic year. At the bare minimum, you're going to be uh, waking up for morning formation at 6.30. Uh, you'll be in classes from about 7 o'clock to 4 o'clock every day. You'll be marching to lunch. Uh, usually once or twice a week after school, you'll be doing some kind of military training. And then, uh, like Saturdays, every couple of weeks, you'll have uh, some kind of training as well. And then, uh, for the parents, uh, one thing that my parents struggled with when I was applying to the academy is, especially my dad, he was like, well, why do you want to join the military? Uh, but I would say like, I was just genuinely interested in like all the opportunities that are available, like out of the academies, like Lieutenant Schaefer is going to be a pilot. That's a lot of people's dream job. I'm going to be in the space force. I'm going to be working with you know, all these big companies like NASA, like SpaceX. So there's really just so many opportunities available to you out of the academy. And even while you're there as well, I've had so many friends get sent to the Pentagon to do research. Uh, they get sent to Morocco. They get sent to Spain to do language immersion programs. They get sent all across the country to compete in all kinds of sporting events. So it really is a unique experience. And uh, yeah, just I'm super grateful that I got to have it. 
I'm just gonna say be resilient and like don't self-eliminate on your applications. If your scores aren't where you think they need to be to get in, we don't have any minimums at the Air Force Academy. I'm, I don't think any of the service academies do because we really focus on the well-roundedness of applicants. So where you struggle in one area, you may make up for that in another area. And if you do have lower test scores or like a lower GPA or something, then most of the averages of who we're accepting we have a lot of prep opportunities, so don't like see your test scores and think, oh, I can't get into any of the service academies. I'm not going to even apply. Definitely go for everything. Don't let the service academy or don't say no to the service academies. Let the service academy say no to you if that's, you know, the path that you're going to be on. And there's a lot of other routes to service. But um, just like do your best and be resilient through the application process. Um, do test early and often with standardized testing. But um, but don't like sell yourself short. Don't count yourselves out. Um, you guys probably all have it in you. Um, you just need to be resilient through high school. Thank you, Lieutenant Singh. Lieutenant. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you here. I'm Captain Dick Petrucci, United States Navy, retired. I graduated from Naval Academy in 1961. Joe Bellino's class, if anybody is interested. Uh, I spent 25 years on active duty. I'm a naval aviator, was a naval aviator. I'm still flying today, um, not in the Navy. We do have Top Gun. <laughs> I participated in the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, the Cold War. My warfare specialty was anti-submarine warfare, so I spent a lot of time searching for submarines in the Atlantic and the Med. It was a great mission. I really enjoyed it. I'd go back in a heartbeat today if they'd take me. They said, eh, you're a little too old. Enjoy retirement. Okay, admissions brief. Naval Academy is located in Annapolis, Maryland. That's the capital of uh, Annapolis. <laughs> capital of Maryland. It's located on the Severn River, which flows into the Chesapeake. Um, we've got Washington, D.C., 25 miles that way. Baltimore, 25 miles that way. Midshipmen walk out the visitor's gate, gate one. They are downtown, waterfront, Annapolis. That's great. It's great. Uh, it's a good place to be. We've got everything there. Everything the midshipmen need is there in Mother Bancroft. We call it Mother Bancroft, Bancroft Hall. That's the dormitory, and that's the chow hall, and that's everything except classrooms and training facilities. Okay, and uh, athletic facilities. Okay, I can skip that. We've got 26 majors available. 80% of the midshipmen take STEM majors. The other 20% non-STEM Secretary of the Navy says midshipmen, 65% um, of the Midshipmen Academy have to take STEM majors. And because of the STEM core curriculum at the Academy, all midshipmen get a Bachelor of Science degree. You can major in Chinese, you get a Bachelor of Science degree. Everybody gets that. And uh, the core curriculum, I think I have a picture coming up. Small class size, ratio eight to one. We have one to one military uh, professors and civilians, military that teach there. I had an opportunity to do that. You have to have a, at least a master's degree to do that. Civilians have to have a PhD to teach there. And uh, I tell you, the, the faculty works really hard to keep the midshipmen there. We don't want to see anybody fail out. We don't. We know how hard it was to get in, and we want to keep you. So uh, our attrition rate is somewhere around 8%, which is pretty low. Out of that 8%, probably 6% of them did something bad and they had to leave. Only about 1% to 2% uh, leave because of academic purposes, and that's pretty low, pretty low. Lots of varsity sports. <laughs> All midshipmen are required to play a varsity sport every sports season. If you don't play a varsity sport, you play a club sport. If you don't play club sports, you have to play an intramural sport. So on top of all the academic load, which is at an average about 18 credit hours per semester is average for, for midshipmen. You gotta play a sport. You have to go through professional training. And if you're a plebe, you have to put up with all the nonsense the plebes have to put up with. So I'll tell you, at 11 o'clock at night when it's lights out, <sighs> thank you, thank you, thank you. But I have a little, little trick that I used to do too, mandatory lights out. If you really need to do some extra studying, you pull the blanket over your head and you get a flashlight, you read. 130 extracurricular activities available at the Naval Academy. You can see how they're grouped. Cultural, music, service, there's more. 
And I said, I'm not sure how midshipmen have time to do ECAs when they have to do all their academics and they have to do all of their uh, play sports and they have time for this. Okay, all midshipmen receive full uh, scholarship tuition, room and board, medical and dental. And this is true for all the, the academies except Merchant Marine. I don't know about Merchant Marine. And Coast Guard, I don't know about them, but it's $1,217 a month. Now, they don't get all of that money. A lot of it is held back. Room and board, uniforms, books, computers, blah, blah, blah. Plebes get $125 a month, real spending money. And it goes up by about $100 a month. So seniors are getting five to $600 a month. One of my recent graduates, oh, at the end when they graduate, if there's any money left in their account, they get a check. One of my recent graduates, uh, I said, hey, uh, how much money did you have in your account when you graduated? He said, $15,000. And I said, okay, what car did you buy? That's what they do. They go out on West Street to the car dealers and they buy a car. Well, I'm gonna need one. Graduation, it's a five-year commitment. Unless you go on to follow, follow on training like sub-school or aviation, aviators have an eight to 10-year commitment depending on their community. So it's, that's half, that's half a, a, of a career right there. So anyway. You can um, drive ships, drive submarines, fly airplanes, or if you're a crazy person, you can be a SEAL. Now, ladies, you cannot be a SEAL, not yet. Uh, but females are allowed to go explosive ordnance disposal. Mothers don't want to hear that, I'm sure. Yeah, but we, we'll take them. We also have, those are our warfare specialties. Those that can't qualify for that for physical reasons, we have supply corps, oceanography, intelligence, et cetera. So we've got a full range of uh, career things that uh, our graduates can get into. Summer seminar, anybody here uh, apply for summer seminar? Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, good. That's open for juniors. In January, junior year, you can apply for summer seminar. You have to take a candidate fitness assessment. That's what you have to do. Uh, you also need a Department of Defense medical evaluation. Uh, DODMER, Department of Defense Medical Evaluation Review Board. Okay, you have to do that too as well. Okay, um, nominations, you already heard about nominations. Everybody's got four. There are others too, like JROTC or presidential, if you're qualified for those. But everybody has four. Apply to all of them. I think Ron already talked about that. Apply to all of them, all of them. Advice for admissions, I'll let you read that. That's what we look for. Okay. Full scholarship, guaranteed employment, location, leadership, and character development. Graduation. A lot of people ask me, Captain P, what happens to all those hats? I said, well, it's bad luck to go find your hat after you've thrown it away, but you can't wear it anymore anyway. You're no longer a midshipman. So what happens to the hats? Oh, I don't have a picture of it. Come see me, I've got a picture of what happens to all the hats. Naval Academy is rated number one public school, okay? I don't care what the other academies say. <laughs> okay, I think I, I'm wrapped up. I'll, I'll be in the back, come see me if you have any questions. Fill out a candidate card and I'll follow up with you. I'd like to meet with all of my people one-on-one -on -one so I can go into detail on all of this stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. And uh, I can tell you the, uh, the Brotherhood of Graduates at the Naval Academy is extremely strong. Children of my classmates refer to me as uncle. Um, I Zoom happy hour every Friday afternoon with classmates all around the country. And for my classmates that are here in the area, we meet for lunch every month up in Brandon. The Brotherhood is incredible, Naval Academy graduates. Okay, congratulations to all of you. Good luck to all of you. Work hard, work hard, okay? Get a little bit of sleep too when you can. Okay, thanks a lot. So uh, I actually like to tell people, I and Jose, we represent the Alumni Association. We're not here looking for freshmen. We're here looking for people who are gonna graduate. It's, it's a, one of the easier of the academies to get into in some aspects because not as many people know about it, so the line isn't as long. But when you get there, it's extremely demanding. You will earn a four-year degree in three years on campus. 
because you will spend one full year at sea as an internship. Uh, what's the Merchant Marine? Uh, it's not the circus. We're not asking you to give your children over to the circus. When you go out on the interstate, you'll see trucks going up and down, different names on them. Go out in the ocean, same thing. Ships going back and forth with different names on them. Why does the government have a Merchant Marine Academy? In time of war, when these other people need to go someplace, they need us to get them there. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. They have ships in reserve, but they don't have crews for them. So the Merchant Marine Academy, to the government, we're the insurance policy. We have to stay as a reserve officer for eight years. That way they know our home address and phone number if they need us. And during these times of war, during Vietnam, during Korea, where which was a big thing, uh, the desert uh, wars, people were reminded of their obligation. And, and that's what we're all about. So what do you get at graduation? You get a Bachelor of Science degree, you get a commission as a second lieutenant or an ensign, and you get a Coast Guard license as a merchant officer. That allows you to operate a ship, a civilian ship. The obligation, you will work in the, you will do something for the government for five years. You can go in the military on active duty for five years. You can work on a merchant ship for five years, a U.S. flag merchant ship for five years. And there are certain jobs that the government needs people for, and if you apply to those jobs, they'll give you an exemption for five years you're expected to do that job. So let's go back to the military aspect for five years. All these other schools, today, tomorrow, somewhere between the time you now and you graduate from high school, you will pick the branch of service that you're obligated to. You will go to their school for four years, and after that, some guy you've never met, or woman, will assign you to a duty. And then you have to leave five years of doing that. At King's Point, that decision of what am I going to do with the rest of my life is put off to just before graduation from King's Point. And then the unique thing about us, you have to go find a job. Part of that application process is if you decide, I want to be a military officer, you go apply to any of the branches, including NOAA. You, you can work this off at the hurricane people. You go there and you say, I want to be an officer. The cool thing is, you're going in that meeting with a degree from one of the best engineering schools in the United States, and you say, oh, Navy, I want to be a pilot. If the Navy doesn't have room for you, you go, Air Force, I'd like to be a pilot. About 9 to 10% of our graduating class every year goes right into Navy flight school. Apparently, there are a couple of young people that do not want to make a career of crashing airplanes on ships a couple times a day. So they apply to the Air Force and they go to Air Force flight school. We have a few people, they go in the Army. It's what they always wanted to do. They didn't quite get into West Point, so they used us as a backup plan. We have no problem with backup plan concept. About 30% of Kings Pointers go to Kings Point because it was their second choice. So we have no problem with being number two. Our big thing is that every young man, woman at graduation gets a job, a very good job, that they want to have. That's what we're about. Our football team is horrible. <laughs> I think last year they lost every game. They lost homecoming to a liberal arts school. It doesn't matter. It's a game. Everybody got a good paying job at graduation. That's serious. We take that very seriously. We take being a Kings Point graduate as an engineer, we take that super serious. We have rules. We do not let people who are not smart in. That's rule number one. Then we want to see good, everything these other people want, we want. We're a little more lenient about athletics. You have to be athletic. You do not have to be the captain of the football team. Remember, our football team doesn't do well anyway. <laughs> and at King's Point, I was there, I think, about five days when my company commander told me I had just volunteered to be on a crew team. I was all skinny or that. <laughs> so these are the options you can do all the, and I'm told that you can even apply for some sort of commission in the US Public Health Service. So at it, 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 it 21, 22 years old, that's at King's Point. That's where you make this kind of a large decision. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? We have five degrees. We have two degrees in marine transportation. Cut to the chase. 
You take those if you want to be the captain of a ship. Now, see, sailors have captains. Seafarers have masters of the vessel. You take this program if you want to be the master of the vessel. That's a good way to end up. It's a harbor pilot, by the way. That's a pretty nice paying job. Then the other three here, marine engineering. We have three. Nice. Uh, marine engineering, if the two that are ABET accredited, the big deal with those is if you want to go back and get a master's degree in those fields, you take one of those, you get a little more differential equation. When it comes to talking about math and science studies, the center on our football team, he can do calculus without any help. <laughs> if he can, he goes home. We have no thought degrees, we have, the rule is, no lying, cheating, or stealing, and that is very big in the academic world. And you either pass or you go home. It's, it's that simple with us. So if the football, if we, seriously, we lose to MIT, RPI, Worcester Polytechnic, it's okay. It's just football. <laughs> this is another really cool thing about King's Point. This is why it's hard. It's a little easier to get in because less people are trying to ask the congressman for an appointment. It's harder to stay there. You're going to earn a STEM degree. Most people go to a civilian college, they spend four or five years getting a bachelor's degree in a STEM subject. At King's Point, you do it in three years. Because you spend a full year at sea learning to be not a sailor, but a mariner. Because when you graduate, either as an engineer or a deck officer, you are in possession of a piece of paper that allows you to assume the watch of a ship at sea. You're allowed to drive a boat without an adult supervisor. During this time of sea year, you travel all over the world. I personally went to 12 countries while I was a midshipman. Before I retired, I went to 43 different countries. So part of this being a seafarer is it's really good, besides being good in math, if you have a little adventure in your soul. That's, that's a big thing with King's Point. So we go to the next one, athletics programs. We have all the sports that everybody has. You know, so if you're into sports, that's great. Here's another big thing about King's Point. You go to Georgia Tech, you get a football scholarship. Some kid that's bigger than you wrecks your knee. What do they do? They take your scholarship away, and your parents either figure out how to keep you in Georgia Tech financially, or you go home. At King's Point, you don't have to go home. In fact, at King's Point, if you're struggling academically because you're on a sport, most likely someone's going to stop on and tell you that you should reevaluate the situation. You should maybe take your academics a little more seriously. Waterfront programs. We do excel at this. And back to when I was a skinny kid, I rode a boat. We excel at sailing. Everybody learns to sail a boat. We actually have a student band. The other schools have student uh, club things. They have this. Our marching band is actually made up of students. So if you have musical abilities, make sure you, if you need to apply to King's Point, make sure you put that down. Because when they have the big meeting where every, all the professors yell back and forth into a room of who they want, the band guy gets to yell too. <laughs> These are some breakdowns about um, what class of 2023 started out with. There are no published minimums. You need a 1300 on the SAT, you've heard that before. We're gonna go over, that's my public service announcement at the end. Uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, about 10, 15, 20% of our, our freshmen were Eagle Scouts or they were Gold Scouts. Uh, about 10 to 18% are Boy State. We're sending a group to Boy State in Tallahassee if you're going to Boy State, that's through the American Legion. Uh, these are what our graduates do that go decide, I want to be a military officer. About 9 to 10% every year go to be a Navy pilot. We don't know what the ones in the Air Force and the Army do. We don't have as good of track into them, and sometimes we think they do. They don't tell us the truth. <laughs> but Coast Guard, and every now and then some people say, I want to go in NOAA, and that's perfectly fine. This is a reiteration of the military obligation. You will be a reserve officer for eight years. There is no second way out of that. You, you know, uh, that's two weeks a year for us. That's two weeks a year if you're going to see, you know, that's 16 weeks. Boy, that's not all that much time. 
Uh, and the food's pretty good, and they have, they have officers' clubs. So. Uh, the biggest thing that I want to stress, you can uh, see if there's one more. Oh, that's yeah, one more. You can look at that while, while I think I'm done, because I'm going to talk for a minute. Mm -hmm. So the big thing with Kings Point, I want to go to West Point, apply to Kings Point. They have 10 nominations. The head of admissions for Kings Point is a West Point graduate. You know how to the fence. The guy that's the admissions officer for the Southeast United States is a former Air Force pilot. They understand why about 30% 30, about 30 of the students really want to do. That's not a problem for us. As long as you're committed to serve your country and you meet the qualifications, the other stuff isn't a problem. The, uh, and you don't even have to lie on your essay. You can just be honest about it. They, they know the deal. But I want to talk about the essay for just a second. So you're applying for a scholarship that's worth four or $500,000. So let's just say you spent 100 hours working on this essay. You won't. Well, let's say that's the most money you're ever going to make an hour in your life. Do a good job of it. My wife sits on a scholarship. She's, she's brought home scholarships because she's spending my money, so she tells me about it. The young lady uh, wrote the letter to a different organization and didn't have the courtesy to change it for the organization she was applying to. And then the bad news was several of the other ladies were in that other organization, and she had spelled their name wrong. She didn't get a scholarship. Yeah. So try to keep those things in mind when you're writing that essay. If you have a compelling life story, tell it to them. Not, oh, I want to be a good American. Tell them why. What's your interest in the United States? You know, uh, the congressman uh, told us he grew up in a blue collar house. I grew up on farmland on the Tamiami Trail. That's 14th Street for people that don't know where that is. These schools, all of them, they are tremendous socioeconomic accelerators. All of these schools are in the top 25 schools in the nation, rated by a thing called payscale.com. And if, if your son or daughter is going to any school or you're thinking about it, go to payscale.com and find out where that college ranks. Most of the state colleges in Florida are 200, 400, we're 23 for earning capacity. Serving your country is a great thing to do. There's nothing wrong with making some money while you're doing it. So, can Kings Pointer be successful? Senator Kelly, he's a U.S. Senator. He's a former NASA astronaut, flew four missions on the space shuttle. Before that, he was Captain Kelly of the United States Navy, where he was a test pilot. He learned flying in the U.S. Navy after he graduated from the United States Merchant Marine Academy with a degree in engineering. One of the sitting judges in this jurisdiction, she is a Kings Point graduate. Her twin sister is a Kings Point graduate. This lady, she's a Kings Point graduate. Two years ago, she was the alumnus of the year. Normally, you get that at a college by giving them a lot of money. She didn't. She's the president, the CEO of the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. They build nuclear aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines for the Navy. Thousands of people work for her. I looked it up. Between her salary and her bonus, she gets about $4 million a year. We like to think she learned some of the tricks of the trade at Kings Point. She was obviously a heck of a person to begin with. But she, she didn't let things like the glass ceiling stop her, that's for sure. She is a Kings Pointer. And then for the public service announcement of it, the SAT test. Amazon sells this book. It's about fifteen dollars. It's the three hundred and fifty most used words on the SAT test. And what's nice about this book? They group them by definition, so they're easier to learn. Now, Princeton Review, the people that actually write the test, for about twenty dollars, they'll sell you a set of five hundred and fifty flashcards of the people lead test. The people who write the test will sell you. The 550 words that they use the most on the test. How cool is that? There are these books that you can take. These are not terribly expensive. 
You can buy these on Amazon. There's a thing called Khan Academy. That's free. That'll help you get a better grade on the SAT test. Princeton also runs an SAT prep service, and there are other schools that also do it. I personally know a young man. I've done several people. I've given them scholarships to improve their SAT scores. I have one young man started with 1210, did Khan, got to a 1260. Now remember, the higher you're going, the harder stuff is to learn. But he went and did a Princeton uh, boot camp, which was about $600, but, but that's a good investment. He went from 1260 to 1310. He started out, none of these schools were going to take him, to several people. Yes, he had to invest in himself. He had to spend some time. Now, if you're starting out much less than a 1,200, you may not be able to do that. The next fellow that's coming up is from a prep school. And if you didn't quite get everything in high school that you should have, his organization will help you with that. They're not inexpensive. It's a year-long program. They analyze you, find out why the academies didn't want you. They help you fix that. And they have like a success rate in the 90 percentile for getting people who were not going to get into an academy to get into an academy. That is a small investment for a several hundred thousand dollar scholarship. And, and I, I cannot overemphasize the value of these educations once you get out of these schools and you go in. You've done your service and you want to move on. I have sat in boardrooms. Well, the only reason a project got approved is because they pointed out I was a case pointer and I wasn't used to failing at anything. At my age, I still have a job. I'm told now that I'm a philanthropist. I've done well enough that I'm starting to give the money away before I'm even dead. I have to talk to my wife about it some days, but it's a lot of fun. So my point is, if you go to one of these schools, the only thing that's going to slow you down is if you just get tired and don't keep up. These are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful opportunities. Does anybody have any questions? Well, then I'll get out of your way. Thank you very much. We got 48 into academies this year, 54 last year, 72 the year before, and 101 the year before. We're going to get back up to 100 uh, this upcoming year. I got well over 100 young men and women coming into Marion this upcoming year. Academics, chemistry, physics, pre-calc, calc, English comp. I run the physical training program. I can do planks with you. I can do push-ups with you. I can do uh, push-ups with you, and I'll, I will do it with them. I'll run five miles with you, too. We'll get you where you need to go, uh, academically, physically, militarily. We have an excellent, excellent air aviation program. If you want to fly and you don't have any hours, you're just starting out, we got an excellent, excellent program that will get you in the air, maybe up to solo if you've not, not anything yet. We will get you in the air. Um, uh, physically, uh, I run the. Uh, I will give you the CFA, the PF, PRT, or PFA. Anything that you need, we will give it to you. I will help you with your nominations for your congressman, your senators, your vice president, and uh, we can get you an ROTC nomination for West Point. Um, so we got a young lady in this year for West Point who just had a vice president and an ROTC. She went to Air Force, so uh, so we got. I got quite a few young men and women who have multiple. Uh, appointments this year and I just hugged them all they sent them home uh, this past week if you got any questions come back get a business card at least come up for a visit I got well over a hundred young men and women coming from uh, all across the United States this upcoming year we got a boy from Hawaii into Coast Guard he got a girl into May, uh, from into Navy from Maine this year all across the United States we have young men and women love to have you come on up and uh, give us a visit so keep up with fire I'll see you thank you Well, I've done one pretty much every year, and uh, I try to get the best and the brightest kids out of Manatee County and Hillsboro because I have that big part of that district now because it's so important to our country. We're putting in these kids from the academies, uh, and we've got a lot of talented kids. One year I put in two girls from Palmetto High School that they went to the Naval Academy. I just think it's a huge opportunity for the community. They, they spend, We spent about $500,000 taxpayer money, so I take it very serious. But the big thing is is that these are future leaders. We need these leaders, a lot of them in terms of 
national defense and security issues and flying a lot of our top gun type jets. Uh, we need these kids in, in these in these programs. And today we just had standing room only and and a lot of them, you know, are at the top of their class. They're good athletes. So I was very excited about the turnout today. Uh, and I'll, I'll say also, I just see in Congress now, a lot of the top uh, recruits that are coming in on both parties, really, are graduates of the academies. 170 nominations that we've done for the Naval Academy, the West Point, Air Force Academy. But again, I, I realized I was the first one in my family to go to college as one of six kids, and it made a difference. I got a ticket to get you in a race, let alone an academy graduate, you know, from that standpoint. So I, education's real important. My first job out of, out of uh, college, I couldn't have got without a degree. So someone said it's a ticket to get in the race. So I try to do everything we can to promote our kids to be all they can be, be some for college. But they, a lot of people might get a good high school education and then get into a trade or something, and that turns into a small business for them someday. And then all of a sudden they've got a, you know, a great future in front of them. You know, you talked about the Ivy Leagues, and they're obviously at the top of the top, Stanford and all that. But at the end of the day, not, not only do the kids get a great education, uh, but they also walk out with leadership skills after a period of, they get another five-year commitment, the second lieutenants, captains that end up, and then they, they can move on to other professions or things they might want to do. But it's a huge advantage they have over other graduates that might have got out of top schools because of the leadership component uh, and the, the idea of giving something back to your country in terms of public service. And that's why, you know, I thank the parents at the end of the sh program because uh, I know for a lot of kids, they couldn't get there without the parents. Parents got to keep them focused, and they're competing with a lot of other talented kids in town. We've got a lot of great high schools in Manatee County. We've got a lot of good kids coming out of these high schools, and we can only take so many. So my point is, is that for all of them to work hard and think big and and if they expect it, they'll get it because uh, it starts with expectation. They've got to feel strong that this is something they want and they can do. And with that, we'll help them get there. Yeah, I think I, I, one thing I'd say is that, you know, the, one of the things they're also looking for is leadership qualities. You know, whether it's being on a football team or some team, sports team, being a captain. And then a lot of maybe student body. There's a lot of other things they like to see them in, not just about the grades. you got to have ideally 1300s. But above that, there's a lot of other things they like they look at as well. Well, we recognize our awards and we recognize the teachers because they contribute so much and I don't think they get paid enough. And I think the other thing is, is it's nice for them to have a little uh, recognition from their peers because they're different people that are out there. So I, I just think that at the end of the day, as I said earlier, it's a ticket someone said to get in a race and you want to. A lot of the kids could do a lot more, but they, a lot, many times they don't have the support. They get that support from teachers or other uh, friends and family. And it's important for them to, if they can get a four-year degree, get a four-year degree. I know there's a lot about debt and things today, but they'll more than get that back uh, in, in terms of the future. So I just push it because I know what the difference it made in my life. And I grew up very blue-collar uh, home. My parents worked hard, both of them, but there's eight of us in a small house and uh so yeah, getting that first degree got me got me in the race. Yeah, I lead the I'm chairman of the Florida delegation, and we have you know 30 members, including the two senators. We have a lot of impact to get a lot of things done. But my focus in Washington, primarily, there's a lot of things you can do, is on taxes and trying to keep taxes low. Uh, and then obviously we're looking to do more trade around the world. I work closely with our port here, uh, and then healthcare. Healthcare is a big issue. We spend over a trillion dollars just the government making sure Medicare is viable long-term for a lot of our seniors. And there's a lot of things we're even doing on a lot of different areas of medicine that's making a big difference. So taxes, uh, health care, trade, those are the big issues that I stay focused on. And then, of course, obviously, what's going on on our southern border. Everybody's very, very concerned about that. We need control of our borders. Otherwise, we lose our country. So I'm pushing more aggressively every day to make sure we get that fixed. Yeah, I, had, I was head of a talking about town hall. I had a town hall. It was about 400 people in the room. Someone in the back of the room stands up and says, hey, Vern, you work for us. And I said, you're right. I'm, a, I'm humbled to be a member of Congress. I'm a representative, and I represent you, try to represent you the best we can. I've taken a lot of votes. Someone might not, not agree with every vote, but I try to take the right votes for our community. Well, I think the biggest thing in, in terms of like the county commission, the you know, the mayors and the community in Bradenton and others, 
is that, you know, I'm there for them. I, I, I'm like the community cheerleader. I'm not identifying projects. I might suggest a few things of what I hear. But at the end of the day, they got to tell me what their vision, what they're trying to do for the, for the city and other things. And it's my job to work with them to get it done. And I've had pretty good sex. We had about $30 million worth of projects we got this year and $30 million last year for projects that uh, they've pointed to, they think are significant. And most of the commissioners way off, I tell them you got to make sure you get pretty much unanimous consent because I'm not going to go to get this done without your uh, making sure when we get done with it, it, it gets implemented. So, uh, but I, you know, I work for the community and that's why I look at it. And, and I tell any of your viewers today, if there's something they need, we got three great offices, uh, one in Longboat and one in Lakewood Ranch. And anything they need, we're there for them. Thank you.